Now, this, we're doing a cool thing today. We are at the, say the name of the conference. Internet Dagen. Internet Dagen 20. It's okay, right? Yeah. 15 in Stockholm. And we are simultaneously recording the Aquia podcast mm -hmm. and Drupal Snack. Uh, one would say Drupal Snack. Drupal Snack. Yeah. You sound a bit like a Belgian trying to oh, say it. Oh, oh, oh. oh. The interview's over. <laughs> <laughs> We're recording our podcasts at the same time. We're planning on yeah. releasing them at the same time. Please introduce yourself to yeah. everyone. Hello, my name is Leander Lindahl, and I've been in the Drupal community since about 2010. And it's a great uh, opportunity now to get to ask these hardcore Drupal guys a lot of questions. Uh, so perhaps after this, I'll also be like part of the yes, the iron team in the center of. <laughs> yeah. Right. Yes. Deal. Boing. Welcome to the Acquia Podcast. Drupal technology, community, and business. Welcome to the Acquia Podcast, Drupal technology, community, and business. There's a module for that? There, of course there is. Okay, so a lot of people know you as extreme Drupalists. <laughs> You're always at the Drupal Cons, always doing keynotes and a lot of activity in general. And I guess you're really knowledgeable about Drupal itself, but I would like to kick off by asking you about who you are. Do you like have an elevator pitch, like a few sentences that would explain who you are and what you do? Sure. My name is Robert Douglas. I have, in fact, done Drupal in some way or another since around 2004, mm -hmm. so that is a long time. And I currently work for a company called Platform SH. We are a platform as a service hosting company, and we host any application that you want to put on the web. Yeah. And what about you, Jeffrey? So, most everyone in the world calls me Jam. Yeah. And I am, my title is Evangelist. I work for a Drupal service provider called Acquia. Yeah. And um, we do a whole range of things that essentially, whether you're a developer or an end user or uh, um, anything in between management, we want every Drupal experience to be a success. Mm -hmm. And we're building out more and more products and services that are focused around the digitalization of business itself. Okay. My personal deep abiding interest is at the intersection between people and technology. Um, so you'll find me on my podcast talking uh, not only with developers about what they've built, but how they thought of it, how they got there, stuff like that. And I've been doing Drupal, thanks to this guy, since about 2005. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, that's great. <clears throat> you must be taking really long elevator rides. <laughs> Ow. Burn, I'm burn. Sorry. No, that was not meant to say. <laughs> it was just because I had a lot of the answers you provided were like, Calming questions. <laughs> but I have another one, kind of personal question, and this, by the way, is kind of uh, copied from some WordPress podcast that I listened to. Uh, so I thought it's a bit like a Proust questionnaire. That this guy, it's the uh, WP Elevation podcast. He always has the same schema, so I'm trying that on you. So what do you? The other one, the other one that you should check out is the Actors Studio. Yeah, I know. Question format. Yeah, that's it's like the awesome. original. So this yeah. is not going to be the actual. Okay. But it's, it's the same format. You have like a set of questions that I feel uh, lets you get to know the person kind of well. So what was, was your dream and like ambition growing up? What was your dream job as a kid? So as a kid, it was really clear from the age of 10, I wanted to play uh, the French horn in mm -hmm. orchestras. Mm -hmm. And by the time I was 30 something, I had actually achieved that goal. I was in a orchestra in Germany playing the horn and I wasn't making very much money and I had achieved most of the goals that I had set out to do and I couldn't imagine myself doing it for 30 more years. Mm -hmm. So I read a magazine stand that said, young man, do Java. Okay. And I was like, oh, that's me. Yeah. I'm going to do Java. I, it was what it, exactly what it took. I read one magazine and then I started learning Java and that turned to a programming job and that turned into Drupal. Yeah, great. Well, what's about you, Jam? We met playing French horn yeah. and before either of yeah. us were doing anything with computers. Mm -hmm. um, in fact, it was long ago I, enough, I guess I owned a computer, but yeah. Um, when I was 16, mm -hmm. when I was 16, I decided I wanted to be a performer and we played the same instrument. 
Uh, my username everywhere is Horn Cologne because I play the horn and I live in Cologne. That's really clever, by the way, because uh, it helps you remember. That's two things I always knew about you. It, it helps him remember, too. <laughs> right, it's, oh, and... Um, what do I do? Where do I live? And we actually spoke a bit Italian earlier because you have an Italian wife and I used to live in Italy. And then you told me in Italian that you actually live on the same street in Cologne. 1,600 meters apart. Yeah, that's, that's right. great. So do you ever grow tired of each other? Mm -hmm. A lot of <laughs> Usually. He doesn't. <laughs> it's one-sided. Yeah. It always works. Okay, let's well, go on now. That, yeah, well, now well, that the floor is cleared. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, I also wanted to ask you, like, when was the first time you encountered the phenomena of the internet? Do you remember, like, what the, what it was like? And yeah, I was studying for a, a music theory examination in, in school. And I, I uh, was in the computer lab working on a music program when I clicked the internet icon yeah. and uh, up came an ad to play Monopoly and I clicked the ad to play Monopoly and I spent the rest of the night playing Monopoly instead of studying for my examination. Okay. <laughs> Did you pass it? I won. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And what about you, Jan? Do you have a specific memory of the first time you encountered the internet? It's become so pervasive so quickly, along with cell phones and such. It's, um, but it, it was actually, you know, quite a gradual transformation in the last 15 years, I guess. Mm -hmm. And I don't think I do. I don't think I have a friend. I remember very clearly when my daughter was three and we had an inter internet connection at home and that was new mm -hmm. and we'd been using it. And she wanted to go swimming, and friend, my wife said, well, I don't know uh, if it's open. I don't know where she could, we could go. And my three-year-old mm. said, look on the internet, Mama. Wow. <laughs> I remember that very <laughs> clearly. That and we both looked at each other and said, these mm. kids are not going to grow up the same way we did. No. <laughs> but uh, did you, like, at the time, did you realize that this was something that was going to be a big part of your life? It was there, like, an instant fascination or which was just oh no i called i called it right away you know the first time i saw youtube i was like that's gonna fail <laughs> right and the first time i saw twitter i saw twitter it was like what is this good for i could never think of a way to use this no well i can confess i had the same feelings about facebook i thought oh this is way too personal who will want to like put everything about themselves there so but yeah so we're not any 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 great profits at least so. <laughs> but uh so Let's see what I'm, yeah. Do you then remember the first time, I think you partly already answered that, but how you like came into Drupal and when the first time was you like saw a Drupal installation and... I go first because it was, it was me first. So um, I had, my first job was working on a Java based CMS yeah. that still exists, but it's proprietary. Okay. It's very good. Mm -hmm. And because you wrote it, <laughs> no, I didn't. I was um, I was um, essentially unqualified to do anything at that point okay. because I had just learned how to program Java on the train ride to orchestra rehearsal, literally. Okay, so you were kind of winging it. Like I was winging it. I didn't even know the German word for keyboard, for example, okay. or computer. So when I showed up at my job and they said, "Herr Douglas, here's your Rechner," I was like. I know. Wie bitte? <laughs> mein was? <laughs> Und wie the, heißt Tastatur, nicht? Keyboard. Genau. Tastatur auf Deutsch. I didn't know that either, though. <laughs> so uh, I was not really qualified to be working on this magnificent proprietary Java CMS. No. So when they fired me, yeah. uh, several months later, or laid me off, rather, um, I wanted to build websites for musicians. Mm -hmm. And I had a friend who was working on the internet, and I asked him, well, I don't have this tool available anymore. Mm -hmm. How could I build my websites? And he said, well, you should check out Mambo and Typo3 and Drupal and about five others that don't exist anymore. Mm -hmm. But really look at Drupal. They just added a taxonomy feature mm -hmm. that might be interesting. So I downloaded Drupal and didn't look at any of the others mm -hmm. and didn't evaluate any other system ever. It was just like the magazine stand. Mm. The magazine said, young man, go Java. And I went Java. Mm. I downloaded Drupal. It worked. I never looked back. And what version was that? Was that already four point something? Four point something, yeah. Like and then you've 4.3 or 4. 
And you became, came into Drupal through Robert or Yes. Yeah. So I also and screaming. Um, <laughs> Had you done I, any um, previous like web building? Nothing. No. Nothing. No. I am a performer by education and training and experience. I <clears throat> am uh, multilingual. Yeah. And I spent my days working as a musician, rehearsing, performing, traveling, mm -hmm. and translating. Yeah. So I translate from German to English and from Italian to English, and I was doing a lot of technical work, and I was doing a lot of film industry work, and the situation wasn't dissimilar to his. I wasn't making uh, money that, you know, money for the amount of effort that, that felt sustainable mm -hmm. for the rest of my life. And as satisfying as it was, um, being in that piece of the entertainment industry was very difficult. So I was doing subtitles, script translations, mm. and, and uh, stuff like that. Was that in Germany? or That was in Germany. Yeah. Um, and he knew I was frustrated. And he'd found PHP, and he'd yeah. found Drupal by then, and started telling me about it. And uh, essentially told me, I needed a website for my chamber music group. And he mm. told me, you can build it yourself. You like that design stuff anyway. Mm go learn HTML and CSS, and I did, and I made a site, and it mm -hmm. was fun. Mm -hmm. Then we made your first PHP website together mm -hmm. for the second version of that, and then I really enjoyed it. I really yeah. loved it. And, and you made a site for my uh, driving instructor in Germany. That's because true. I, I had to learn how to drive again. Yeah. So, <laughs> yeah, so that was actually my first gig. I did build a, yep. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And oh, so your driving instructor was like your client, more or less. <laughs> well, his client. His client, yeah, but through you. So yes, so yes. That, I still, I'm still of... waiting for my referral fee. <laughs> Okay, so so he, he, but the, he said, so if you like this stuff, I'm going to tell you what you should learn, mm. and then I'll monitor your progress, and when you get to a certain point, uh, I will try and get you work. And it worked out, and I fell down this incredibly deep, beautiful hole. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And uh, <clears throat> I guess it's a big, or perhaps not, which could be a big leap in time. When did you, like, get involved with Acquia and Dries and all that? When did you, like come into like the inner circle. When did you get involved with Dries? So I was, I think, employee number seven. Uh, yeah. Oh, with Dries. With Dries. With Dries, right, right from the very beginning of my involvement in Drupal, I was communicating with Dries because yeah. the project was really small then. Was I'm, it like in those, uh, I remember, 2004. I remember being to Drupal cons. I don't know if it's my, imag my, just my fantasy, or if it's like, I feel like at every Drupal con, someone has shown this picture of Dries in the Mexican hat. Yes. And then someone has shown the picture of how it's like three or four guys sitting at a table. This was the first DrupalCon. Yeah. Was it back in those days? So Dries with the hat predates the first DrupalCon. Yeah. The first DrupalCon was in 2005. Were you there? Yes, yeah. the first European one. So they had a meetup at OzCon in Portland that might qualify and Dries gave a presentation mm -hmm. on Drupal. That you could possibly count, but inspired by that, Dries decided for EurozCon, the European mm. version of OzCon, to have a, a sister event mm. in a nearby town mm. called Antwerp, yeah. uh, where he invited all the Drupal people who were interested to show up, and he was amazed that like 40 people signed up. And they he had, had to double the size of the conference venue from one conference room to two. To two. Yeah. But this conference is amazing because mm. almost all of the people who were there, almost all 35 of us, are still involved in Drupal. Mm. And the things that we did at that conference were, for example, uh, architect CCK, mm. which turned out to be Fields, mm. you know, mm. CCK in Drupal 6, and then Fields mm. in Drupal 7. Now everything in core is a field. Uh, that was where that architecture happened. And mm -hmm. uh, it, was, it was fairly amazing. Uh, so then um, that turned later into a connection with Dries that led to me working at Acquia. Yeah. And my first connection with Dries was an introduction. So my first DrupalCon was Brussels 2006. Mm -hmm. There were 200 people there. Registration was I handed Dries a 20 euro note at the door mm -hmm. and I got a t-shirt. Yeah. And because I was working as a professional writer, mm -hmm. he brought me on board through Rob's recommendation to write all of the text, including the API documentation and the initial legal disclaimers when he founded Mollum. Okay. So the launch of Mollum, I wrote most of that website, mm -hmm. and that kind of turned into an audition for my becoming the 18th Acquia employee, and my first job at Acquia was uh, in engineering, writing, testing things, and writing documentation, mm -hmm. essentially. Mm -hmm. So your basic skill sets, is that like not coding hardcore, like? Never, never been. I, there was a period in between where 
he had spotted that I'd learned enough Drupal mm. <clears throat> after a couple of years and was st had started to introduce me to people. And I was working as a consultant mm -hmm. enough to quit my writing and translation, which felt really great. Mm -hmm. And working in Drupal was great. I think nowadays I'd call myself a site builder. That was pretty much the skill set that I was covering in those mm -hmm. days. And within less than a year, I was the person that Acquia needed because I knew Drupal pretty well mm -hmm. and I could communicate yeah. about it in writing pretty well and that that came together very nicely and what about you? you have you been or are you still i'm i'm really ashamed of my lack of knowledge but have you been and are you still no, a it's call, fine. nobody call knows contributor? what i do and nobody knows what i do it's a yeah, great that's question that's what i'm trying to <laughs> because i know as i said at the start of this interview i know that you guys speak a lot and you travel a lot obviously now you're here in stockholm but are you like active in the actual coding of google so no not now but mm. i was a I made core contributions to five, six, mm -hmm. and seven, yeah. but not to eight. No. So I was totally not involved code-wise mm -hmm. with Drupal 8. Uh, the modules that you might recognize from my past mm -hmm. are include like Memcache module and Solar, yeah. Apache Solar. Cool. Yes, I remember that actually because I worked at the Node 1 for a while mm -hmm. and they were using Solar in yeah. one of their projects for Ikea. And I helped, for example, uh, I helped Drupal.org mm. adopt Solar as its search, which was a mm. great improvement mm. over what they were doing before. Yeah. So for a long time, I did a lot of coding, mm. but uh, starting at Acquia and now then through Commerce Guys and now with Platform.sh, which is the company mm. that I'm at now, mm. I've been more first consulting and now management. Mm. And how come you left uh, Acquia, the like home of every, <laughs> at least in my interpretation, the home of every hardcore Drupal person? Well, I have deep ties to the Commerce Guys company. I mm -hmm. was there at the moment of inception, yeah. so to speak, yeah. because um, a member of my family actually founded the company. Yeah. And It's uh, not Ryan Serrano. No, I yeah. helped. I, yeah. It was Mike O'Connor, and I yeah. helped Mike recruit Ryan. Mm -hmm. And so I was uh, an advisor to Commerce Guys from the beginning, mm -hmm. and I was actually on their advisory board. Mm -hmm. And they had an opportunity to become a product owner. Mm -hmm for a number of products that they had taken venture capital for. Mm. And that sounded like a good opportunity to me that uh, wasn't available at Acquia at the time. Mm. And it turned out to be a really great choice and I really like the role of product owner. Yeah. Um, I now actually run the help desk and um, I'm responsible for enter enterprise client success yeah. on our hosting platform. Yeah, cool. So, um, <clears throat> more questions. <laughs> I think it's a bit stuck here. Um, Yes, I've actually been thinking about, like the last one and a half years, I personally have switched from doing everything in Drupal to also working a lot with WordPress. So I was kind of curious, what is your view, like insiders from this oh, wow. early Mexican hat days of like <laughs> Drupal's state at the moment? I know, of course, Drupal 8 has just come out the door and it's great, I've tried it out, it seems really promising. But like from a market share point of view, etc., it feels like some of the air has kind of, uh, what's the English for that? It's kind of like... Cut the air out of the yeah, tire. Exactly. That's the, or, at least the feeling in, yeah. in like the Swedish uh, Drupal S crisis I move in. <clears throat> what's your like take on that? I'm so like, Drupal 8 is an extraordinary set of achievements. Mm -hmm. And not only is it that, but they're made in such a way that we are going to be able to make Drupal 8 itself better and better and better mm. during its release cycle. It's incredibly exciting. I've been pretty he heavily involved in the development cycle, um, <clears throat> not doing code, but talking with the people who've been doing it in the last few years. I've had a lot of conversations about it, about how it's put together and what the consequences and benefits of that are. I'm completely convinced we have the right product at the right time, and the excitement is coming back yeah. really, really, really strongly, and I think we have a chance to grow incredibly as a community, yeah. um, thanks to this technology partnership with other open source mm -hmm. projects, thanks to this up-to-date architecture, thanks to it being really, really ready to tackle things like the Internet of Things mm -hmm. and and um, you know be a content engine in the middle of a lot of other stuff. The um, the but WordPress, WordPress is good technology, mm -hmm. and if I were only wanting to do a blog plus kind of a thing, or someone I knew wanted that, I would say go to WordPress.com. But, but is it a bit like that, that, that Drupal is kind of focusing, and perhaps increasingly focusing, on more like enterprise scale 
web solutions because I come from like a small shop, mostly working by myself. Uh, and for me, like Drupal uh, can sometimes be a, a difficult tool. I mean, it, it takes uh, more time to get to the same point in WordPress. And I understand, yes, uh, I mean, in Drupal. Uh, I understand uh, if, you, if you're building like a set, the ones you were speaking of today, like government, websites, etc., then that's no big deal because the project itself is so big that the gain you would have from quickly getting everything up would be so little compared to the entire project. But is that kind of fair to say that Drupal is focusing... If you're doing a small project, you shouldn't use Drupal. Is that the way it is? That's not fair to say. Is it okay if I continue? Mm -hmm. So. Um, as a technologist, yeah. my blog right now is running in Jekyll, mm -hmm. um, and I think it's really, really important that we touch other stuff, use other stuff, um, try out Typo3, mm. try, try, try Sculpin, try, you know, uh, Symphony. It's really important that we know what's going on and so that we have a better chance of making the, you choosing the right tool for the job. Yeah. Now, in general, for a small, for specifically for a blog, mm -hmm. WordPress is, is a really great product. Drupal, gives you a lot of advantages in terms of scalability and what have you. Mm. So yes, Drupal 8 certainly serves the enterprise market mm. very, very well. It's mm. going to be very quickly and heavily adopted there. Mm. But if you're a small site owner, if you live in a country um, with multilingual requirements, Finland, Switzerland, mm. Belgium, what have you, um, you need easy multilingual. Mm. Um, Drupal 8 has four modules, you turn them on, the whole thing is translatable, localizable. It's amazing. You need that as a, yeah. for a small site. Drupal 8 is responsive out of the box. Drupal 8 can edit from edit from any device mm. out of the box. I mean, um, all of these advantages, like super quick um, page delivery through BigPipe and through the, the front-end optimizations, that's great for small sites yeah. too. So I think it's really a case of these, these advantages that get driven by the people who can afford mm. to push them in. Enterprise clients, big sites, people really investing in Drupal and getting back. Mm. And the small players, the NGOs, the wh mm. whoever it is, get the advantage of being on the same yeah. uh, playing field uh, uh, technology-wise. Mm. So I, I'm actually, especially in the case of Drupal 8, I think it serves uh, every audience that wants to be on the web very, very well. Mm. Well, I'm glad you mentioned that uh, you think it's important to try different things because I... Like you to said about Java and then Drupal, I was, I started with Drupal because I have a friend that I, whose judgment I trust very much when it comes to, like coding and technology, and he said you should try Drupal, and I thought well I'll try Drupal, and since I'm I was originally not very much into coding, I've improved a lot since then, but then I thought I'll just do Drupal because it's better to just do one thing and become good at that. Uh, but now when I've recently tried other stuff, I feel it really enriches my perspective, both on Drupal and the other platforms. So I'm glad you mentioned that because I was trying to figure out a way of asking you that question. Is that like common practice within like the core Drupal people that they look at WordPress and these other systems to kind of see what are the benefits, what, are, what could we learn from these other platforms? There's a, a very famous blog post from 2013 by Larry Garfield called Getting Off the Island where he said, people, there are other projects out there, yeah. go check them out. And the follow-up the follow um, blog post, I believe, was called something like Building Bridges, mm -hmm. and there was another one, and Larry continued and said, okay, now that you've gone and met other communities, mm -hmm. Go build a project with somebody else's technology. Yeah. Go do it. It'll be good for you, you yeah. know. And, um, and, and um, Larry, apart from being amazingly smart and one of my favorite people, I mean, that's, that's exactly right. Yeah. We, even if we truly believe like, hey, Drupal will do everything. And yeah. I mean, we have an economic interest in that. Truly, yeah. you need to know what's going on around yeah. you. And it's not the perfect tool for everything. Yeah. No, that's interesting. I found it really enriching to try other stuff. And it's, it's actually changed my approach to Drupal slightly. <clears throat> and one, one improvement in Drupal 8 that I figured out um, two weeks ago or something when I downloaded the then release Candidate 3 mm -hmm. uh, is like the block system that you can have multiple instances of one single block. That's like a huge improvement that I could never get. Why doesn't this exist in Drupal? So I'm, I'm happy to hear about that because, um, yeah, the reason I'm asking is, as I mentioned at the start, I consider you to be like hardcore Drupal people, so you would probably know. 
<laughs> we are the. <laughs> I'm so not hardcore, but that's thank you. No, so. it's like <laughs> like if you're like a small, tiny guy from Sweden, and you go to like a Drupal con. There's like this gang of the <laughs> the real Drupal people, and they all know each other since 1975, more or less. I, I, I think it's a gang of the oldest and loudest. Yeah, I know. <laughs> <laughs> not the hardest core. <laughs> no, I guess it's my. Right, you're the oldest then. My you're the of, loudest. <laughs> it's my lack of. Uh, uh, proficiency in English. Yeah. So, a friend of yours told you to check out Drupal. Do you have a first Drupal memory? Uh, yes. Well, not I, not a specific one. I guess it's like with you and the internet. But I remember like the general feelings they had about Drupal, and it was at the beginning. <laughs> they're usually terrible. Yeah, it was Drupal six, <laughs> and I was really surprised. It's and you you said that's also in your uh, yours. Uh, speech earlier today, like that when you, if you, or perhaps it was Thomas in the panel discussion afterwards. But anyway, someone said if you just install Drupal without like the extra modules and extra work, uh, usually the reaction is, is this all? And that was really my reaction. Mm -hmm. And then, as a, I'm originally a designer, and nowadays I'm more like a front end developer, do a mm -hmm. lot of coding, but I was absolutely horrified with the, <laughs> the like interface. But that changed soon enough because I, I don't remember, it was towards the end of, was it 2009 or 10? I, but anyway, Drupal 7 came, uh, like the stable version came two months after I became acquainted with Drupal. And then I was just, yes! And I remember, I think it was Michael Bolton, was that his name? No, mm -hmm. not Bolton. Yes. Is it yes, 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 yes. Because there's a singer yes. as well called... No, it's Mark Bolton. Mark Bolton, right. yes. <laughs> okay, sorry, Mark, if we <laughs> confused you with the uh, ballad singer. But anyway, he did a lot of great jobs and work. And I remember at the Drupal Con Chicago where I went, we had uh, Jared Poncho of uh, Lullabot mm -hmm. speaking about like pure design. It had nothing to do with, with Drupal or technology. Well, a bit with technology, but... So that was a really great influence into the Drupal project, I think, that you had. And I'm not... Perhaps you know about it. Was that like a conscious de decision from Greece to bring in more, like, user experience goodness into the project? Well, yes, they paid for it. Yeah. Oh, it, they it did. Was, it, was, um, it was an initial, uh, quite a hefty investment on the part of Acquia yeah. to Im improving Drupal. Um, so, you've been doing Drupal for six years, more or less, now. Yes. What made you stick with it? Uh, as I said, when I did the choice, I knew little about any such <laughs> CMS, and I decided, I'll just stick to this one. Come rain or snow, I'll stick to this one. So, I learned that one well. And at that time, like, that goes back a bit to the question I asked you about, like, the market and the feeling in the... Mm -hmm. At that time, Drupal was really hot, at least in, in Sweden and I guess all over Europe and the US, etc. Uh, so I felt, yeah, this is the future. <clears throat> and it has been, of course, I, won't, I don't want to diss <laughs> Drupal because I've learned enormously from that. Uh, and especially I've learned like the culture, both the culture of the community, which everyone always praises, but that's uh, justified. And also like a good, feel, I feel I've learned a good coding culture with Git and commits and documents and stuff. So it's been a great learning experience. And, but this, the reason I stuck to it was like stubbornness. <laughs> so, uh, but after five years, I kind of dared to open the window a bit and <laughs> take a peek at the other side. Well, there's, there's a point that I want to make mm. here because you, you put your finger on it, but only mm. lightly. It, there are two things. Uh, what you really want in technology today mm. is to have honesty in the requirements gathering. And mm. most people don't have that. Mm. It's not a problem of choosing the right technology. Mm. That's actually pretty easy if you've been really honest with yourself in requirements gathering. Mm. What do you actually need to do? What are your actual requirements? And at what point in time do you need to fulfill them for mm. any given project? Mm. And most people's requirement lists are so long that they basically need the entire internet. Mm. Mm. No software gives you that. Mm. So if you're honest with your requirements, you can narrow that down into what's the most key fundamental requirement, and then you can choose the right technology. And mm. once you've chosen the right, right technology, then you have to apply good coding culture. Mm. Just like you said, it's mm. it's not that systems have won in technology today. It's not Drupal versus Joomla versus WordPress. Mm. Mm. It's about what ideas are the right ideas for doing any given project. Mm. And if, if you have that, and if you've done your requirements honestly and not lied to yourself about what you actually need, mm. then 
you'll make a good technology decision. But then uh, <clears throat> that that's um, perhaps that can like connect to another thing I actually had in mind. If we still have time, we'll have to see. Oh uh, yeah, we still have some time. <clears throat> I actually wanted to find a way of asking you about, because I remember, <clears throat> I think there was a panel discussion, perhaps it was in Copenhagen, the Drupal, I'm not sure, but on one of the Drupal cons where I went, or Munich, uh, there was a, someone tried to kind of raise the question of, should there be a, a path within the Drupal community for like commercial, commercialization of projects? Mm. in order to let uh, the developers uh, simply make a living. <clears throat> I've talked uh, about this a lot for years. Were you one of the like campaigners of that? I wouldn't say I was necessarily a campaigner. No, but one who thinks that could perhaps be a good thing. Yeah, I think it's necessary. Yeah. Uh, if you look at any Drupal conference, then the vast majority of people are doing it because they're paid. Yeah. And it's in a, in a question where your existence, your financial existence and your livelihood allow you to do something that you love, yeah. then you owe it to yourself to really protect that and make sure mm -hmm. that you have a good income from that. It's yeah. a necessary thing for the software. And I think this particular discussion was like, with regard to like selling modules and stuff in the, in the, the way that they do in the WordPress area, uh, sphere. Uh, what is like the state of that discussion? Has that just died out, or, and what is your what are your opinions? The only that? things that people sell mm. in the Drupal community now is time. Are services, mm. which is their time, or they sell um, web-based services mm. like hosting yeah. or like Malum. Almost nobody pays to download any code. There are because, a yeah. couple exceptions to that. For example. Uh, there are some people now using Drupal to build software as a service products. Uh, Roomify is one of my favorite examples. So Roomify is a, a module or dis dis Drupal distribution that you can download and you can actually pay to download it and get a support contract from Roomify or you can pay to have it hosted online. And then you get the Roomify software, which is Drupal with modules and themes for a fee, but you get the support contract as well. Okay. But essentially that's selling support, not yeah, selling the sure. software. No, they're selling software as a service. But can you get the software without the support for free? You can, but that's their choice. They wouldn't mm, have to yeah. do that. They could just make it software as a service. But um, what, what, what do you think would happen? Oh, no, not would happen, but what is your impression of the general feelings towards that? Because I remember at that time, I had the vibe in the room that most people, oh, that's really bad. and. Yeah, but that changed over time. Mm -hmm. I have to tell you that I brought up the idea of um, providing long-term support and uh, you know access to updates and uh, you know a published roadmap and mm -hmm. you know actual timeframes like the professionalization of the mm -hmm. software mm -hmm. process. I brought it up many times at many conferences. I think the last time I directly talked about downloading paid modules for long-term support. Uh, Etc. Mm. Um, was in a Drupal camp at London, mm. and the session ended, and the people in the room demanded that we go to another room to keep talking about mm. it in a very positive manner. Oh, that's so great. the attitude toward the idea mm. actually changed over time. Yeah, Be but nobody really took up the model yeah. except themes. Yeah, I'm happy to hear that. That's like discussion was in a positive uh, uh, note or on a positive note because. I, at that time that I tried to describe, which I don't remember when it was, I was one of the people who thought, oh, that's really, uh, we don't want to pay for this. But since I take, took like uh, a leap into the WordPress space, at, initially I still thought, oh, that's really crappy, these guys who try to come like m monetize their, their plugins, etc. And But over time I've come to realize it can actually be very beneficial if you've like for twenty-five dollars or something like that, you buy a plugin that's really where people have the opportunity to put in the hours to work on it and get because everyone has to make a living, especially, well, not especially, but I guess it's a, a particularly a challenge if you're working with web technology in open so in an open source environment because most of the participants aren't like working for Acqui or something like that. They have their own little web shop. And they work. Yeah, they try to make a living. So if you spend four hours one day trying to create an open source plugin or module, that's like four hours that you won't get paid, at least not in the short run. Sure. So I'm happy to see that those thoughts are still 
Well, let me put it this way. Yeah. If you're going to adopt software mm. to run on your website and you're going to depend on that mm. software, you want to make sure that the developers of that software have the time and mm. the mandate to develop that software and maintain yeah. it for you. And if they're struggling to make it by because they're doing uh, one web project or after another for customers that they have to go hunt, mm. then they're not going to give you good software. Yeah. So I... I <clears throat> In my job interview with Dries to, to join Acquia, he explained the idea of Acquia, which the business model was providing support. Mm. Uh, that was the first idea. And he said, look, all of our stuff, everybody can download it and do whatever they want. Mm. And there are a lot of people in the world with a lot of time mm. and very little money, and that's perfect for them. Mm. But the people we're going after, they don't have any time and they have plenty of money to pay for it. Mm. And it's interesting that that's really come full circle. I was at, uh, it was in Berlin, Uh, last week at a conference called the Open IT Summit at the mm -hmm. Abgeordneten House, mm -hmm. and the discussion after my panel uh, came back to exactly this point. And I think for the Drupal community, part of it was just gearing up to take this leap of faith into asking for money for more than just selling hours. Mm. And um, one of the people in the audience there said, "Oh, we have a we have a product that's completely open source, all on GitHub." Uh, you can have it anytime you want. We have this package where we sell it and we provide certain guarantees around mm -hmm. it. Um, almost nobody downloads it and we have a, a very healthy business. So mm -hmm. there's there's a lot of truth in, I want peace of mind and I want as little risk as possible. Mm -hmm. And that's there's actual real value in that. Right. Yeah, because I've been actually, it's kind of out of self-interest. I've been toying with the idea, perhaps one should create uh, a module of some type and try to sell it. But then I've been kind of afraid well, then perhaps everyone in the Drupal community will think I'm just a really terrible person who tries to introduce this commercialness into the innocent, beautiful world of open source. Who cares what they think? Right. You don't have to ask permission. Okay, great. So, well, anyway, I think we could conclude that part. And I wanted, I, I listened to your talk earlier today, and there was one interesting point, or there were two interesting points. Uh, The one thing was there was a woman, I think she said she was from Ukraine, uh, who asked you afterwards, uh, like she explained, they are, I think they was, were a government agency or something in the Ukraine and they didn't have any money or very little money. And they had been recommended Drupal and they were using Drupal and they had a team of developers. And she said that, that one of the things that they were told when choosing Drupal was that Well, Drupal is open source, it's a big platform, you can, you can switch teams of developers. <clears throat> and as we all know, <laughs> listening to this, I guess, uh, it's not that easy. And you explained to her that, yes, it's, in theory, it's the same building blocks, or well, actually also, but then the way you implement them can vary very, very uh, much. So, and that's, that's really a, a difficulty within Drupal that I've also identified. I've been, I've several times been asked to take over a project that were from someone else. And every time I'm really baffled. I, usually I, I figure it out after reading through the code and stuff, but that's, that's the difficulty within the Drupal process. And you said Acquia is trying to do a lot of stuff to amend that difficulty. And you mentioned something about the distribution. I think it was called Spark, is that true? No, no. no. I'm gonna change the other battery and then yeah. I'm gonna tell you. He's going to say lightning, lightning, <laughs> lightning. <laughs> anyway, we'll see. So anyway, you were about to answer my question on uh, the Acquia project or distribution yep. that could amend the difficulties of different ways of implementing. So, so he, um, certainly for a certain class of enterprise customers, Acquia is working on a Drupal distribution that's called lightning. Mm -hmm. Uh, the Drupal 8 version is already well underway, mm -hmm. and it's a coalition also with a lot of module maintainers and architects and companies out in the Drupal community, mm -hmm. and it's a very opinionated way of building Drupal. We are going to make a data architecture that's like this, and we are going to make it scalable, and we are going to you know, choose workflows, and there's a lot of stuff that's just implemented as a very, very solid base mm. that you can build on, but all of that base is standardized, so you don't run into the, pro the problem where you have service provider A and service provider B and service provider C all working for the same large organization, mm. and then you know, sometimes it's hard to recognize that it's the same technology, as mm. you were saying. And I said, 
in answer to that question today, I said, of, of course, it's a problem. It's a price that we're paying for our success, the scale mm -hmm. of our community and mm -hmm. the service providers, you know, the thousands of service providers that are out there. Um, and I think it's a problem that we as a community need to think about and address. And I suggested specifically to her that, um, you know, whether it's lightning or whether it's something else, take make an opinionated, strong, useful distribution for NGOs mm. and promote it. And that would help everybody. You know, mm. it would increase the efficiency and, and, and de uh, you know, reduce on-ramp times when you change service. I actually thought you were going to, as part of your answer, you would mention this uh, Acquia certification that is introduced. I, I looked at the documentation for that when it was brand new. I guess it's about a year ago. And uh, that contain like you should do various build this type of thing and how would you solve that uh, because that's also I guess one perhaps one of the like answers from Dries and Acquia to how to try and improve like if you have clients that, that use Drupal with the promise of yes you have plenty of developers and agencies in the entire world that you can turn to, and then when they do, it's really well, this how do you how do you decide? Yeah, well, I think a far more important point than the Acquia certification, which is also something that helps towards a standardization, mm. of course, mm. is the fact that Drupal eight uses Symphony, mm. uses object orientation, mm. directly imports a dozen components from other projects that are mutually used on other big platforms mm. uh, like Magento or Easy Publish. Mm. So anybody who's done development on any of those platforms will understand those components in Drupal mm. from their prior experience. And that's something that's not true in Drupal prior to mm. Drupal 8. Mm. Also, the way that Drupal uh, has been 8 has been put together um, with standardized technologies that are well understood from other communities um, and the object oriented code. Um, uh, Angie Byron described the hook system as uh, a naming convention that relies on everybody playing nice. <laughs> Yeah. But you don't. Ha you didn't have to. You could. Uh, um, and I. I think there's a lot of promise in the fact that if you write Drupal eight wrong, it just doesn't work. Mm. So I mean, I hold a lot of hope that that we're on the right path to simplification now too. Yeah. Standardization. I, uh, it's mm. not simplification. Sorry. <clears throat> I also hope that we're nowadays we're on the path to what was it? Standardization. Yes. Good job. So, <laughs> yes. And I guess we've covered a lot of the things I wanted to ask. At least the ones I remember at this point. Uh, but there was a diff uh, one more thing that you mentioned uh, in your presentation that I wanted to ask you about. No, we're not going to sing any songs. No. <laughs> you mentioned that you had a new project called, yes, thinknation.co that was soon uh -huh. to be released and it was really marvelous and exciting. I'm uh, very excited so could about you please Think Nation. Tell us what it is. Um, I'll try for the elevator pitch, but yeah. um, essentially, as I said, the thing that really fascinates me. Uh, deeply and abidingly is the intersection between humans and technology. Think Nation is an event that a friend of mine conceived of, and I'm part of the core team, and we're having the first live event, the first Think Nation event on December the 5th. Mm -hmm. We are booking the second one and planning the third one. We've taken five big questions about humanity and technology. Should we be investing in medical technology to make to extend human life indefinitely? Mm -hmm. Should we, uh, is space exploration a waste of money or mankind's only hope? That mm -hmm. kind of, like the big questions. And we've got 10 very well-known speakers coming in to give 10 minute presentations. And we found five young people between 14 and 24 in the communities, in this case, in Southeastern England, who we've found and we're coaching to also give a presentation. And after each question, so each of the, after the three presentations, there's a panel discussion with the audience about the question. Mm. And we go through five questions during the day. Mm. Um, and it's incredibly exciting. And the people that we've got uh, presenting, whether they're experienced or not, are wonderful. And it's gonna be, it's gonna be really, really special. And I'm lucky enough to be part of that. And uh, part of my job is speaking with all the presenters, finding out what they're about, really going in depth, um, mm -hmm. in video interviews and in, in other forms of media to, to, to explore uh, the, the questions that they, uh, that they got to talk about. Yeah. And what are you hoping to achieve by this like, activity? I get the chance to have dozens of conversations with smart people mm -hmm. about interesting things. Mm -hmm. I love that. That's, that's, I, that's practically my favorite thing. Okay, so the idea is to stir thinking and 
like inspire. Some, yeah. yeah, yeah. So, and it's thinknation.co. Uh, I'm going to be talking about it a lot. There's going to be a lot of uh, uh, media coming out of that. And I really, really do think it's a very interesting vehicle. And uh, yeah, we're making plans for more. Yeah, sounds great. So I'd like to thank you. And I guess you'd like to thank me because we're also in your... Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. That's great. Thanks. Yeah, it's Drupal. It's, always, it's all about the hugs, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> Were you recording? I think so, but I'm not even <laughs> sure if I have enough memory on my device to. I'm gonna go. I want to change the battery on that camera. Okay. Hold that thought. <laughs> Is that what the blinking light means, or is yeah. that the recording? No, it's the battery's about to go. Don't, would you? <laughs>